I want to welcome you to the library for oral history. We have today Andy Vanas, who's a lifelong resident of Somerset, he attended St. Anne's and the public school. He owned and operated the Riverview gas station prior <coughs> to where the holiday station is located now until 1996, and they built the present Riverview Oil Company on Highway 35. And presently, sons Kyle and Dan are uh, the owners, and Andy works for them now. Uh, Victor Martinson came to Somerset when he was 10 years old. His parents bought the Somerset Telephone Company in 1946. And then Victor and his brother Gerald worked for the company all these years, and then eventually purchased it in 1990, 1975. So we'll start with Andy. And when he was growing up, uh, we were going to talk about the movies, how today you can turn the TV on, but we didn't have TVs then. How many of you kids can remember when you didn't have a television? <laughs> or, the <electricity? laughs> or the electricity went out, you couldn't watch TV. Uh, okay. <laughs> did. How long did it go? How long did it last? Uh, a long time. A long time. <laughs> well, when I grew up and we grew up, there wasn't any... Wait, <laughs> there, wasn't, there wasn't any television at all. We had to go out and play in the snow. That was our fun. This is the kind of telephone we used. Any of you guys ever used a telephone? No. Ask about the people behind you. <laughs> they have. See the hands come up? So there's a lot of us people that had to use a telephone like that. And when you lift this, when you got the ring, the ring came, and four or five or six other people were on the same line. So everybody knew what you were doing. Everybody listened. That's something. When I was growing up, we started out. This is a picture that hangs in my shop. This is of where the holiday station was, is now. My dad built that in 1931. Now, if you look closely at it, you can see that the, that the street in the front is gravel. The bridge at that time was just built. It was brand new. And this is before I was born. So this is how long that my family has been in the gasoline fuel business and so forth. And uh, <coughs> this is, we're going to come up forward from here and... and, and try and relate to the kids, the boys and girls, of the things that we didn't have, but you do have now, which is very, very interesting. I have some different pictures that we grew up. One of them I want to show you. Pass it around. Take a look at that picture. Have you ever seen that much snow? Well, it used to snow that much in Somerset. <laughs> it was lots and lots of snow. And at that time, when they would plow the roads and the streets, you couldn't even see the cars go by sometimes. We had so much snow. Well, we were talking about this television. You could watch television, but we had our movies, too. Remember where we used to see them, Andy? We used to go down to the school. Do you remember where the grade school was over here before they tore down? Yes. yes. Okay. On the side of that school, they had a straight wall. And on Friday nights, they would have what they call the outdoor movies. And we would go there and we would watch outdoor movies for free. And it was projected by a projector on the wall. After that, when I used to go to a movie, we used to hitchhike in Richmond. Everybody, all of us kids used to hitchhike all over the place. And can you imagine that we never, never locked our doors? Was that expensive then? No, it wasn't. We used to go to a movie for 16 cents. <laughs> As time went on, and you got your car, where'd you go? Well then, then we used to <laughs> we used to go to St. Paul. But when I was your age, if I went to St. Paul 
probably once, maybe twice a year. One time was to go Christmas shopping with my mom and dad. And other than that, we very seldom ever got there. And then we had to drive in there. Drive in and halt them. That was the big... We used to, or you had a friend that had a driver's license. And there was an outdoor movie in Fulton that they built, and we used to go to the outdoor movie, and it's one of the first ones that we've ever seen, other than the one that was on that, that part over there. And it's, in Somerset, a lot of the kids used to work at the restaurants. Maybe Andy, you can tell us about some of the restaurants that existed as you grew up. There's been a lot of them. Well, there was a lot of restaurants around here. And part of the reason was, is because the state of Wisconsin had Sunday liquor, and the state of Minnesota did not. So there was places like, the, who knows where the river's edge is? And it's still there. It was there when I was your age. There was, where the post office is up over here now, there was a restaurant. And that one burned down in 1956. There was... The Terrace nightclub, where all the apartments are down, the street down over here, that was also a nightclub. Very nice one, very nice one. And in Holden, there was Henny's and Holcomb's. And uh, a lot of people from Minnesota came to Wisconsin because that's why or that's where they could get something to eat on weekends and on Sunday and have uh, a little alcohol or a drink with it. Let's have a special meal. Uh, we were especially the palms, I believe. The special meal that they had was, <coughs> was frog legs. And that was always the case. A lot of us, I was probably a little, little bit too young to go out and catch them myself. Either that or I couldn't catch the darn things. They hopped too fast. <laughs> but that was a big thing. If you catch frogs, then you would go to a local guy that lived right here in the corner, and he would buy the frogs from him. And that was enough to pay for my 16 cent movie, The Marriage Tour. <laughs> well, it's time hey, we, we have a couple of guys here that used to catch quite a few. One of them was, well, I mean, Harold, I understand, wasn't all that good at it, but Jim was pretty good at it. Mm, I cut a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I well, cut I, longer. I, I I remember you guys going out to. Uh, oh, what's his name? Ike's with some frogs one time. I think he had close to sixty pounds of frogs. Mm -hmm. like he went out hunting one night. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and at that time there was pretty good money in catching frogs. Fifty cents a pound, but we had frogs all over. And as kids, we'd follow the the uh, haymore. And then the hay fell, and the frogs would jump out, and we'd go after them. And, but you can't find that today because either through who knows why, there are no uh, very few uh, leopard frogs around anymore. They just kind of disappeared. But the last time I sold frogs was $3 a pound. But they got all pickled and sent out of state for biology dissections. So, but you can't catch them anymore. They aren't around. Uh, the whole habitat has changed around here. Uh, Centennial, 1956. Have memories of that? That's 50 years ago, right? Aren't we going to have the 150th this year? Yeah. Okay. 50 years ago, I was 16 years old. And, of course, that's about the prime of your life, I guess. Everything was carefree and everything would, 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 we could do anything that we wanted to do. One of the big issues was is, is the parades that, that they had in town that came in, and there was large uh, floats and everything that came in from a lot of different towns all the way around. One of them that was the most fun with us is we had a, a Pfeiffer beer wagon was made by Ham's Beer. And you know where they parked? Right here. Right here. And so therefore, us guys running around and so forth, and I was only 16, but every once in a while, we got a little sip of beer. And it really didn't matter. But it was fun. It was a good time. Now, we have to see, and you kids are going to have to have a good time at this. What do they call it? Susquehanna. Susquehanna. 
It should, be, it should be a good time when it comes up. Last one, they had the beard growing contest. They started the pea soup eating contest. Uh, Butch Kohler was the winner of the first one. But there was a guy from California here who wanted to join that contest. And maybe Ralph was in it too. <laughs> and uh, Butch was a little inebriated. And when he uh, ate the, second, the first cup twice, the guy quit. <laughs> so... Uh, that's a story that's enough of that. <laughs> you had your time at the uh, table. Oh, yeah, I was a national champ in 59. <laughs> yeah. In five minutes, how much you could eat. Now, I wasn't bad eating a piece of it, but the bottom of the bowls, you always had the chunks of ham. That was a little rough. But anyway, it was a fun time, a big parade, and a lot of things going on with the 40 and 8 and the Legion. Um, let's continue on. Uh, Athletics in Somerset when we were kids, as being farm kids, uh, I never saw basketball until I got down here in, in about 7th or 8th grade. And it's a lot different today and out in the country, one-room schools, there was no, no even concern about athletics. Older brothers played, but we didn't do much as kids. Andy, what do you recall about some of that early athletics? Well, when we were, when we were young and uh, we started... Of course, like I said, we didn't have any television. Uh, the radio programs were, were, some of them were really fun to, what, to, to listen to and others weren't. So we used to go outside and play all the time. And we would go out and play baseball almost every day. And with this gas station that you saw here that I left it showed you here that my dad had built. This was right on top of the river. So he had a boat. There was a boat that was down <coughs> on the river. And he had a little motor in the gas station. So every day I'd pick a friend or whatever, and we'd go down and take the motor, and we'd go up the river, and we'd go fishing. Or every day we'd play baseball or, or, or something else. In the wintertime, we'd play hockey. But, I mean, it was just not kind of your organized hockey that you see now, everybody would just put on whatever they had and the way we'd go. And uh, it was a lot of fun. We enjoyed it. I used to have to go over to Victor's house and knock on his door, get him out of bed in the morning and say, all right, Victor, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, what some of you younger ones have to understand when you talked about a boat is the river was not what it is now because where the snowmobile bridge now spans the river stood a dam and so there was 10 15 feet of water in there and a wonderful flowage uh, where the dam washed out above that is where we used to swim that was our swimming hole and uh, spent a lot of time fishing especially my day myself and Dale Seacard uh, used to go up the river fishing it was some of the greatest northern fishing in the whole world really had a good time but when I, athletics, when I was growing up, a little older than Andy, uh, up at St. Anne's, uh, we played football all year round. And it was tackle football. We didn't play touch football. We played tackle. Whether it was a foot and a half or two feet of snow on the ground, we played tackle football. And uh, we always followed the high school. And uh, I'd like to mention in 58, uh, we have a couple of guys here that had probably one of the best football teams I've ever seen. Did a great job. Great speed. Big, 19, guy, big guys like like Harry. <laughs> in 1954, <laughs> you were undefeated, unscored upon. Yeah. When Mr. Seibel came that first year, it was unheard of. But yeah. Uh, hey, that's we had a good fun. record. A lot of fun. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of fun. Well, as time went on, the village uh, had one field down here. And originally, Helmer Olson and uh, Harry Diltz leveled it and graded it because it used to be where the lumber was sawed. And then it became Galen Park, and it just sat there for years. And they used to, every town had their own baseball team, and they played Burkhart, and they played New Richmond. And a lot of, uh, little before my time, I just barely remember going to some of the games on weekends. And then eventually, the uh, field was built as it is today. And uh, we've always had a shortage of fields. So, Andy, what were some of the solutions to that? Well, I was on the village board in 1970, 71, and 
they put me in charge of the parks committee. So I had started with Little League Baseball in St. Anne's probably five years previous to that. And I was to the understanding that we needed more fields because we had so many kids in the program that we had to do something. So I brought a proposal before the board to make more fields on St. Anne's property. <laughs> and these fields I brought proposed to the board. See, we never used to have that. <laughs> when I was your race, we never had that. <laughs> Did you tell Harry to turn it off? <laughs> so, so we so we start building fields, and we also built the first hockey rink. Myself and four other guys. Mr. Seibel, not not the Mr. Bob Seibel that you know, his dad. Robert Seibel, was a principal here at high school. And he said, Andy, he said, if you come down, and he said, he, he liked to play hockey. He played hockey through his high school and college years. But we never had a, a, a hockey-sized rink. He said, Andy, if you build a hockey-sized rink, I will make sure through the school that we will support it, put ice on it, and maintain it. So I said, okay. So I went before the board, the village board, and some of them didn't really care for that. They thought it was terrible, absolutely terrible, that we were going to have a hockey program in Somerset. But look at where it's gone since then. All the kids that's been in hockey over the, over the period of the years, all the kids that have gone into the Little League Baseball, then at, after that, the girls came up. Because my wife, Never had athletics in school for you girls. Never had athletics. Didn't have any basketball. All they ever did was fly and cheering. So that's how far things have come since then, which is marvelous. That everyone can, can have a chance now. Look at the Olympics that we're watching on television today. All, all, all the boys and all the girls. Everybody have a chance. Another, another point, Andy. Those fields weren't the first football field. The first football field that I watched uh, football at was actually where St. Anne's School stands right now. That was the first football field. Every fall, they go up there with the mow hay mower and mow the grass down and uh, get some lime out there and lime the field. That's where they played football through the 40s and early 50s. Let's talk about your telephone, Victor. You brought one of these. What can you? Well, there's one behind me. Well, when we came to town, that's the kind of phones everybody had, one or the other. I forgot the crank today, so I can't give you the tingling, but. But in reality, the telephone didn't ring until you got your ring. But this one is, is rewired, so if you turn the crank, there should be a crank <coughs> over here. If you turn the crank, get a tingling. But, uh, that's what everybody had. And they were up on the wall to make sure that the kids didn't play with them. And in a lot of cases, they were high enough so that when people talk, this thing was all the way down. And there were a lot of women that had to stand on tiptoe, so that, you know, they were mounted, uh, well, even for me, there, I saw a few of them that where I would have to stand up there. For most of the French women were only five feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but they were still talking up to the phone. And, of course, in those days, it was not uncommon for uh, people to do a lot of shouting because they didn't have much faith in that. They figured if they shout loud enough, it'll travel further. So... <laughs> But one of the things that uh, when you had 10, 12 people on the same party line, uh, everybody had their own ring. Uh, it might be two longs and a short, or a long and a short, but there were, there were codes for that. 
and of course Andy had mentioned uh, everybody knew what was going on, but in a lot of cases, women were usually in the kitchen. Most of these were mounted in a kitchen. Uh, if they heard a little buzz in there, wonder what's going on, and listen to the neighbor's conversation. So uh, there was rarely any real privacy. What was it called? Rubbernecking. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, it, it doesn't take long before the neighbors knew who the major rubbernecker was. <laughs> One time, the Liberties and the, my brothers went hunting with the Cratleys up north, and they ended up in the bar and got late, and they weren't coming home, so they called my mother, tell them that they had an excuse. They said, Stuart's lost. First thing you know, people are calling up how Stuart they find him. <laughs> 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 Word didn't take long to spread. But in, interesting, uh, probably some interesting facts about the telephone company is it was actually started in 1910 by the Richmond Telephone Company, but it was a separate company. Then it was bought about 1917 by three gentlemen from town. Uh, the first office was in the, uh, the vacant lot between what was the coffee shop and uh, Sue's hair design. That burned down and they moved it to above what's now Ann's Cafe. And it was there for a few years and then it was, what they did was the house that stood previous to the pizza place here in the corner uh, was sawed in half and moved over to the other side of the lot given 25 feet of length, jacked up, a new foundation put under it, and that metal siding building is the original building. The back half was added uh, probably 47 or 48, but the original was only, well, I think 16 by, I can't remember exactly, 16 by 30 or 40. A very, very small building. When we came to town, we had six people living in two rooms downstairs. In the front part was the telephone office, and then the rest of us slept upstairs. How many Interesting. telephones were here in, 70, in 1946? Well, when the folks came, there were 150 telephones, telephone lines and telephones, basically one phone-to-one -one line. There were a couple of places in town that had extensions, but those were rare. And uh, my dad put in 75 telephones the first year he was here, so it was in pretty bad shape. <laughs> How long did it take to drill those holes as you went out in the country? Just we, we didn't drill them. You didn't drill them? No. We used a long handle shovel, nine foot handle on a straight <laughs> shovel, and what they call a spoon. It had a little hook on the end, and you had to dig, dig the holes. And uh, three foot for a 20 foot pole, Five foot for 25. And those are fun. Climb the poles. <laughs> <coughs> and when you ended the business, how many phones did you have? Oh. Around eight, 850, somewhere in there. Okay. And when we sold in 97, there were, what, 25, 21.5 right now. You know the days, the Plurid Hardware and the restaurants, a couple gas stations, that was about it for businesses. And then when the 60s, molten irrigation came in and we forgot. Well, we had, we had Jake's Barbershop. Jake's Barbershop. We forgot the bars in town. Well, yeah. the restaurants and <laughs> bars. The bars. <laughs> and were the main Jake's. businesses. So then... Well, uh, originally, Ben's was across the street yeah. in the uh, Plurid building, which is now a parking lot. Hmm. So things have really changed as far as the business in the town here in some ways, but the business park up in the, on the outside of Somerset now was started in 1970. Andy, can you relate to that business park? It was actually about, for the industrial park, that was in about 80, 86, 87, that we developed that. And there was probably about five people that were most uh, <coughs> instrumental in developing the, the industrial park. 
It was financed through a, a TIF district, which means a tax increment financing. And I put, I had purchased some land from my father-in-law, and we developed that along in with the park. The rest of the, the village bought land from the Lemire family, and that's the original park that was put in there. Now, the development of that park was very unique at the time because the state of Wisconsin wanted industry coming into the state. And they basically were trying to reach out from the state of Minnesota because the state of Minnesota had such high tax laws on it. So when we bought that park, of course we bought the land, did the development, put in the infrastructure of it, the sewer, the water, curb and gutter, streets, and put the park up for sale, or, or the land for sale. And it depended on the business that wanted to come in and how many acres they wanted to buy. <coughs> well, it became very competitive instantly because all your villages and all the towns wanted businesses to come in for, for, for job creation. So I suggested that even though that we had all of this money invested in the park, is to sell it for one dollar an acre. And everybody thought I was crazy. But I said, the, the tax increment financing, that district, when it creates taxes like you see on your tax bill, the school portion would, did not go toward the schools out of that district. The school portion went back into the district to pay for the infrastructure that was designed into that, into that industrial park. But the state had to subsidize to the schools the amount of tax dollars that that would have generated from day one until it was paid for. So <coughs> if you got enough industry and, and uh, people coming in and jobs created within a five year period, all of a sudden, the, uh, the project is paid for, now your taxes go on the regular tax roll and you have an increased valuation by quite substantially because you have some like laser machine, you have SMC, uh, who are some of the other ones? Uh, St. Croix Machine, Tool. machine Tools, um, Jerry Clipper that was up there for uh, <laughs> and it didn't really take too long. It, it only took like, I would say five or six years. And the whole project was paid. So then all of, now this, all this valuation came in. Now everybody's paying taxes, which we wouldn't have had unless that was developed like that. Right now, how much is left? Did you? There's, there's only, there's only about seven or eight acres left in the second portion of the park. And uh, now they're talking about extending it out uh, toward the east, I believe, toward River's Edge in there somewhere. Is yeah. there? Well, they can't. I mean, you, yes. you have the River residential Hill. area yeah, there. Yeah, residential now. there. So uh, they're looking at various places. Okay. Victor, Victor's on that, in, in, uh, that board. Park. Industrial, Industrial Park board. Yeah. A few years ago, Somerset, I can remember my folks talked to me. Anderson Windows wanted to come to Somerset, but they got together and said, no, we want to keep Somerset small and little, so it did stay little. It stayed little until this started, and now there's quite a, quite a bit of industry up there, and there's two buildings being built right now. I don't know what the industries will be, but there's two, two going up now, and then there's only going to be about one lot left, so they have to find more. The one thing that distinguishes this park from most other towns is that in our case, uh, they decided that they would cater to smaller businesses. They weren't out looking for a 3M. They weren't out looking for Andersons. Uh, because for the sole purpose that if one business fails, if you have a huge business that fails, you may lose three, four, five hundred jobs. This way, if you have a lot of small business, businesses, you lose one per one business. Uh, you may lose 20, 30 jobs, but you still have a lot of cushion left in there. So uh, 
this is one of the few parks that cater to small businesses rather than the large industries. Any questions from the audience? Um, what's the building over there that um, they were redoing right across from the hardware store? <coughs> it's um, the white. Yeah, the white. The old town hall. Oh, the old town hall. Oh, that's 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 the Somerset Township. Okay. Uh, that is where they. You know where they are now, where the fire de uh, uh, department is and everything. That is their offices, and that's what they had for many, many, many years. Okay. So they want to preserve that as a antique, Rita? <laughs> Historical <laughs> building. Historical, Historical building. building. Yes. Um, was Anne's Cafe here when you were a kid? Anne's Cafe was. That came later. No, we had the Belle Isle. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't remember when the Hands Cafe I'm came. I'm not sure exactly when that, but that that has been. I think that's been a cafe for a long, long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, one thing Andy didn't mention on he was a kid, all the extra fun they had was it used to be a dump where Float Ride is, right across from uh, where Andy used to live, and they dumped everything in there. Everything went in there. Nobody saved anything. So one of their pet jet. Uh, Things to do with what? <laughs> well, every, every, everybody in the town, in the township or the, or, the, or the village would come over there. And of course, the place was infested with, with rats. And I'm talking about big rats. They're that long plus a tail. And they lived down there in that dump. And uh, so people would come down and, and they would probably. If they had uh, from the farm a dead calf or something, sometimes they would throw it in the dump. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the rats would go in there and feed on that. Well, people got the idea to go down and start shooting these rats because they didn't want them all the way around. And then everybody would come out and shoot rats. And I used to live right across the street. So I kind of had to duck once in a while to make sure that everybody was on the up and up. And when you have a lot of rats, it attracts big. Snakes. What kind of business did your grandfather have, AJ? Didn't he have a livery stable at one time? Yes, he also had a store. Yeah. But uh, that is that is a picture that there's even horses there. So <laughs> that's way before my time. Uh, my my grandfather, AJ, also owned Bass Lake Cheese Factory at one time. And uh, so he's, he was in business all his life. My dad was in business for himself all his life, and I've been in business all myself for all my life. So it's the same thing as if you had a family farm, and your grandfather owned the farm, and then your dad <coughs> owned the farm, and maybe passed on to you someday. Andy, this is an interesting picture, because the building that's standing next to that is the original school in Somerset. And that was moved, I'm trying to think if that was late 40s, early 50s. That would be, that used to stand between what was Sawyer's house and uh, Johnson House. Yeah. Johnson House. Johnson house. I, I remember them jacking it up. This is an apartment house right there. Carrying it out of town. Oh, and I can't remember the exact years. Wait, all I know is that um, somebody northeast of town bought it and turned it into a grain bank. Was well, that cheese factory or your grandfather was in town? No, that's like cheese factory. Mm -hmm. Was there one in town? Yeah, there was, right? The warehouse, the telephone company's warehouse, right now stands on exactly the same site as the original. Well, <coughs> Benner's, 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 Benner had a song that one too. Afterwards. You own that one too? I don't know, Jim. I don't think so. I don't know, but I don't, I'm not sure. Any other questions?
Linda, thank oh, yeah. you very much for coming. Andy has some more pictures. I have some more pictures, so certainly. Everybody come on and take a look. Thank you. So this this is the gas station that my father built in 1931. At the same time that the bridge was built in Somerset. You know, boxing was a big thing back then. Is this the St. Anne's in the back He had all the reflexes in the family. Who is this? Is this St. Anne's church? That is the St. Anne's school. Over the over the top of the gas pumps. Well, a little bit about Gerald's height. And these two cabins here belong to the hotel, classic Shays Hotel, and they rented those out for people that would stay in the cabin and go fishing in the river in the summertime. And we can see the prices down here. You can see the prices okay, down there. Well, yeah, yeah, this is the older one. Yeah, brother would have been a freshman. Yeah. Is that your brother? Yeah. Coming float. That would have been used for the homecoming, and they used to always used to use farm wagons and a tractor to pull it. And if you really look back here, this is a 1956 Oldsmobile parked behind it. So James Van Oss, was here's my oldest brother, who was killed in action in World War II. He was killed in Germany after the Battle of the Bulge and the liber liberation of Paris, France. This is a copy from the office of the mayor of New York City who sent a letter to my mom and dad pertaining to his death and his sacrifice that he gave for his country. This is how the American Legion here, club here in Somerset has been named after him because he was the first person in active service that was killed in World War in any wars previous to this. That's where I remember. And he is. This small picture here is when he was home on leave before he went overseas. And that is me. So it's the oldest of the family and the youngest of the family. And the metal plate is what came home on his coffin in 1947 that was kept for a keepsake. And tell us again why, uh, w when he died? He died in 1944 <coughs> uh, from inaction in Germany. When Jim's body came home in 1947, he was, had an honor guard of six servicemen with him. And he was, with, the wake was done at our house and I can remember as a little boy that they stayed next to the coffin 24 hours a day for three days until he was waked and on the uh, after the funeral and the burial.